Welcome to the Living Your Greatness podcast. I am your host, Ben Mummy. The purpose of the podcast is to inspire millions of people across the world to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being. Living Your Greatness is becoming the go-to resource that CEOs, elite athletes, professional coaches, and entrepreneurs rely on to upgrade themselves. The podcast helps you master the best of what other people have already figured out. So I gladly invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy tuning in to today's episode. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy, and today we have a new guest to the show, and his name is Andy Plymer. So for those of you that don't know Andy, he is a physical education teacher, a rugby coach, and a passionate bird watcher. Birds have fascinated him from a young age and continue to do so today. He has seen over a thousand species throughout the world and one day aims to hit his 2,500 mark, which would represent one fourth of the world's species. He currently teaches at John Abbott College in Montreal, Canada, where he focuses heavily on outdoor education. So Andy, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to have you with us, brother. Hey, mate. How are you? Cheers for having me on. Pretty uh, pretty stoked to be talking about birds. Uh, usually, I'm... Um talking about rugby and when I do talk about birds people kind of get a glazed over look on their eyes and uh, so great to great to be on a pod to chat. I'm super stoked to have you on and, and jam with you. Before we kind of hop in today I kind of mentioned in the intro you know that you're a physical educator, you're a rugby coach and as well as a bird watcher. I'd like to start off by putting all titles aside. Who is Andy? Well um, uh, I suppose I'll start at the beginning. I was, uh, I was born in Australia, grew up in Australia I was born in a, a little mining town called Broken Hill, which is um, where uh, BHP, the big, uh, the big coal and steel giant, uh, first first kind of got founded in the late eighteen hundreds. Um, my old man's a geologist, so basically wherever there's uh, any kind of ore bodies, uh, I probably lived in that town. Uh, or if there's a university with a geology department, I probably lived in that town as well. Uh, so I moved around quite a bit. Um, pretty typical kind of Aussie upbringing with, uh, you know, grew up surfing, grew up going camping out in the bush all the time with my dad, um, you know, playing cricket, all, all those good things. Um, and then uh, after after year 12, went to uh, University of Newcastle, started doing, uh, I loved biology at high school. It was like, it was the one subject that I was like, uh, it just really clicked and I, I felt like I had a connection with it. Didn't like chemistry, um, but ended up ironically teaching chemistry for 11 years and really loved it um but yeah I, I started doing a bachelor of science did a first year bachelor of science and then uh, i was really found the way it was delivered so boring and i was a bit kind of uh disgruntled a little bit you know uh, it just put me off it was just a lot of lecture based learning um and i really wanted to get into the field stuff so yeah i, I changed paths completely and um Joined the joined the uh, the phys ed crew uh, at Newcastle Uni, so I did a four year phys ed degree. Uh, as soon as that finished, jumped overseas to England, uh, toured in London for three uh, very difficult but uh, very uh, developmental years of my my teaching, and then uh, yeah, kind of bounced around, uh, did a bunch of backpacking, um, spent uh, a winter in Banff in Canada, and then came to Montreal to play rugby, uh, and that's where I met my now wife Jen. Um, and then, uh, you know, a few years later, I moved here permanently and have been here for 15 years now in Canada. Um, so, you know, still, still loving rugby, still loving being involved in coaching and, but for me, it's, you know, I, I class myself as a dedicated husband and a, a, a dedicated father of three kids. Um, so, you know, whatever coaching ambitions I do have, uh, they, they will never come in front of, uh, the time I, I, I put for my kids. Um, so often I'll, I'll have to say no to a lot of things and I'm totally fine doing that because you only get your young kids once to, to bring them up and to, to enjoy those experiences with them. And so I just basically look at it now that, you know, I get to coach them instead of coaching other people's kids and uh, I love doing it. So, yeah, and, you know, passionate about that, passionate about teaching and passionate about um, being out in nature as, as often as I can. Thanks for sharing about your background of who you are and uh, growing up in Australia and where it kind of took you your path in terms of, you know, going the, the phys ed and rugby route. And then, you know, from there, obviously, you know, coming to Canada, 
we're going to be taking a deeper dive today on the topic of, of birding, right? Because you are a very passionate bird watcher. So from my understanding, you know, I, I did some research. I want to make sure that I was highly prepped for this interview. And a bird watcher is someone, you know, who observes birds for the purpose of recreation or citizen science. But aside from simply watching or listening to birds, I kind of realized that most birders will go a few steps further by documenting their observations, identifying, you know, like the birds that they see, and also sharing like these findings with fellow bird enthusiasts. So is this true? Like, am I on the right track? Could you give us a little bit more of a background of what exactly birding is? Yeah, you've, you've nailed it, Ben. Great job. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people's uh, first impression when they hear when they hear I, I tell them that I'm a birder, they're like, oh, they, they, I think the image is, you know, elderly couple sitting on a park bench, you know, with their binoculars looking at, at, at birds or whatever. And it couldn't be it couldn't be further from from that. Um, I, I kind of look at it as um, I, I find it as a like great disconnect um, from whatever's going on in, in life. Um, I, it's got a geeky science part to it, which I really like. Um, you know, it's, it, you can link up, uh, travel with it as well. Family travel, for example, whenever we go away, um, we're, we're looking at booking a trip to Costa Rica, uh, pretty soon. And, um, I always negotiate, uh, I get a full day with a, with a bird guide that I, that I pay to take me out to try and grab and get as many species as I can on that day. Um, so you can you can tie it all in there as well, and then yeah, and there's a great community aspect to it as well. Um, the Cornell University's um, leading the way in this regards with their uh, with their online uh, database called eBird, and basically that's a that's a database that anyone can use. It's free. Uh, you can use the app on your phone, and basically you go out birding. You you create a, a checklist of birds that you see. You submit it. Uh, if there's birds of interest in there, other people will. We'll, we'll look through the lists and find them. If there's rare birds that are flagged, that'll pop up on a, a rare bird email list that, that you get. My inbox every morning has about five or six different rare bird emails uh, that I either go through or don't. Um, yeah, and then I, I'm on a Discord group uh, as well with uh, all the Quebec birders. It's all in French, so I have to do a bit of uh, bit of uh, Google Translate on some of them. But um, yeah, it's a, it is a great community. Um, it's it's funny though, like it's uh, it's quite competitive. Uh, so everyone's everyone wants to get that mega rarity and be the person who saw that mega rarity, me included. Um, so some 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 people are, are weird about what they share and what they don't, and you know who they let into their inner circle. Um, so there are, there there can be a bit of a gatekeeper uh, kind of mentality, especially in the the old school older birders. Um, but you know that's part of the reason why I, I teach the course I teach, which we'll we'll talk about later, I'm sure. As I want to kind of break down those barriers. I want, I want you know guys and girls, young young people getting into birding and getting fired up about it, and 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 getting getting excited about it. And you know whether it be, you know, part of it is like just put some feeders up in your backyard and, and watch watch a male northern cardinal come in. If that's the first time it's come to your feeder, you're gonna get you're gonna get pretty excited. Um, then you know that might be the gateway to starting a backyard list. And you might get your backyard list up to 40 or 50 species. And then you're like, mm, uh, what, I wonder what else is around my neighborhood. And then you start getting building a county list and, and uh, you know, a Canada list. And and then it's a real, <laughs> it's a real slippery slope from there. But, um, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. And it's, it's people do it at what level they want to do it. Some people will be a casual birders. Others will be more like me where you try to get out every day and get, you know, 10, 20 minutes in. Um, others are just complete maniacs and they'll sacrifice uh, their relationship with their, their loved ones and family and just travel the world and try and see a, as many species as they can. And yeah, so it's, um, it's something, there's something for everyone in birding for sure. I love that. Well, thanks for giving us that background and education of like all these communities, you know, uh, whether it's online or whether it's in your neighborhood, mm. the simple practice of, you know, how there's different levels of birders, which I'm sure we'll go into a little bit more, but even simple ways that we could already, you know, at our home, even just mm. set it up, right? Where on a daily basis, it's there effortless. And that actually made me think of my mom because she set up in our backyard, you know, some good bird mm. feeders and stuff like that. And during the pandemic, especially when, you know, there was a lot more limitation and stuff like that, you know, to see people awesome. and go out, 
We had a lot of Blue Jays always coming, you know, especially yeah. here in Canada. And uh, so it was so cool to see that. So I, I love how you just use that as even like the simplest mm. practice, you know, if someone's super casual or starting to get into it. So that was cool. Yeah, just uh, just, just on that, um, I think I, I usually get an email or a text a week from a friend with a photo of a bird saying, hey, what's this? This is really cool. During the pandemic, I was getting every second day, someone would be like, oh, I, I just noticed this in my backyard. And I'd often reply back, well, it, it's always been there. You 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 just haven't been looking for it, but right now you are. And yeah, the the numbers of birders or people who said, I, I am into bird watching now during the pandemic, it went through the roof. Um, you know, there's um, uh, Birds Canada have a, a, a feeder watch program that runs from the beginning of November to, to spring. And their numbers for their their feeder watch was astronomical, and um, yeah, it's, it was a great um, you know outlet for people during what was you know a pretty stressful time. I love that. Something that I'm curious about, you know, before we dive a little further here, is how long ago did you start watching birds in terms of more than a, like a passing interest? And is there anyone in your life, you know, who acted as like a bird watching mentor mm. or even influence? Well, I did my homework. Part of this uh, episode, you you asked me to listen to your your last episode on creativity, so I had a good listen to that. And the guest, I can't remember his name, so I, I lose marks on that one. He mentioned something that I thought was pretty cool. He said like, um, everyone everyone's born creative, and he gave like a statistic of ninety eight percent, and how it just plummets the older you get. And I was thinking, oh, that's exactly like birds, like. All, all kids love birds. Like uh, every, you, you watch a three-year-old at a park uh, and a, a robin's on the ground picking out a worm from the grass and eating it. That, 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 that three-year-old is just fascinated with what's going on and pointing and, and talking. And, and, you know, and then somewhere along the way, we, we stop being fascinated about that and we, we get, start getting interested in other things. So I think it's we're, we're, we're connected in, in, in that in terms of nature where we're, we're, we're part of it and there's a natural inclination for us to, to connect with it. So I was always like that. And then I suppose, um, you know, like I said, growing up, uh, going out bush with my dad all the time, I was always, you know, interested in Australian wildlife and, and those kind of things. And, and then I suppose the, the, the one kind of big turning point was uh, my grandfather. He, uh, he had uh, MS. So he was he was pretty limited mobility wise. Um, so he he'd spent a lot of time just looking out the backyard, uh, and he had some feeders up for for some parrots that would come in and things like that. And he had this uh, gigantic uh, bird book that was like a reference book from a library. Um, and every time I went there, I just pulled it off the the shelf and opened it up and would lay on the floor and and flip through every page. It's almost like I can smell that book right now. It's uh, it had a really unique smell to it. And I basically memorized the book. And then I, I found a buddy in grade five who was also kind of into birds and he had the same book. So we'd start, we'd just randomly start opening pages and cover up the name. Uh, and we, we'd quiz each other for, for hours over, over birds. And we weren't actually bird watching. We were kind of armchair bird watching, I suppose. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, that kind of just the identification side of things really, really got me. And then, um, so, so I was kind of, I never really had binoculars though. So from about grade five onwards, I was just going out in the bush and I'd find a nest and I'd, I'd have a little look in and I'd see what bird would come there. And I was, I was already clear on the, oh, I'm not touching the eggs because some people would take the eggs and they, they collect the eggs. And I was, I was already just felt, no, nah, that, that doesn't seem right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, just, it just kind of became a thing where, yeah, there was a little bit of a conservation side to it as well. Right about that time was when, uh, peregrine falcons were on the critically endangered list because of uh, DDT uh, and them being an apex predator. They were getting the highest toxin of it and it was making them and other birds of prey's eggs brittle so they couldn't successfully raise a clutch. Um, so I, my, my mate Ben and I did a uh, shout out to Ben, uh, Ben Cox, grade five Marks Point Primary School. Uh, we, did a, uh, we did a project on the peregrine falcon and uh, I even wrote a letter to the uh, Prime Minister of Australia, Bob Hawke, legend. Um, and he, he, one of his staffers wrote me back as well. Um, yeah, so there was that conservation angle uh, as well that was really kind of something about it that, that it was important to me that, that we need to, need to protect birds and we shouldn't be doing things that are, that are harming them in any way, as well as just a natural 
interest in in living things and and how it's all connected so yeah that's how that's how it all started i love that it sounds like it came out you know during your early years right so like your childhood right and you kind of tapped into the whole curiosity aspect you were curious as well as you know one of your friends but also that you had that access to you know to stumbling upon that book and it just shows even that one book or that one thing that we see could have such impactful experience I forgot to say that you actually teach a class on birding, which I think is super cool. So what do you like most about bird watching? Is there a sense of adventure and excitement? And do your students feel that as well? Yeah. So yeah, the, well, the, the course I teach is called Nature Identification and Fitness. So it's basically two courses in one, one where they, they, they get to design their own personal fitness program. Uh, and then the other part is nature identification where we're out in the field. Uh, we'll, we'll spend, uh, we do two half day field trips plus, uh, class time out in, uh, the local Arboretum, Morgan Arboretum. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, just the, the beauty of it for me is like, it's, it's so multifaceted. Like I, I, I find it's exciting. You never know what's around the corner. You never know. Okay. We had big southerly winds last night that could have pushed up something rare or there was a cold front coming in. We should get a, we should be able to see winter finches today. And, you know, so you can, you can make some predictions around, you know, your understanding of migration and, and how birds move and the time of year and those kind of things. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's just, I, I, I was very nervous when I first started the course, um, how, how a 17, 18, 19 year old kid's going to, going to take to, to birding. And there is definitely a lot of hesitancy, first of all, um, we have 30 pairs of binoculars. First lesson I do, we go out and we just walk around campus and I'll, I'll be uh, identifying every bird I can see and, and talking about it, every individual species, giving a little story about it. And you can see when they're walking out in public with the binoculars on, they're a little bit a little bit shy about it, which I, I get. That's cool. Um, and then, but then it's, it's, it's great. It's something for everyone. Like the, the kind of stereotypical jocks, it gives them something where it's like, oh, you know what? It's it's okay to kind of be into something that's not hockey or football or something like that. It's okay to have like a little, you know, uh, geeky interest. In, and, you know, I know I throw myself under the bus as well, like telling them that, you know, that, you know, I'm a rugby coach, but I'm also a bird watcher. And the, the two things just don't mesh really, but, but it's okay. And then there's the other kids who are, you know, maybe they're not super athletic and maybe they don't want to go into the weight room and squat and deadlift and all those kind of things. But birding gives them, they're out, they're moving. Uh, it's, you know, a low level cardiovascular kind of boost that they're getting. Uh, and then, you know, the, the huge mental health uh, benefits it gives as well, which is, which is great. I find, I always call it kind of active meditation. So I find when I'm birding, it's just... Well, the first thing you do when you're birding is you're listening. Uh, you, 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 you're identifying most birds by call, first of all, uh, by their song or their call. Um, and then when you're, on, when you're on a bird, it's just nothing else matters. You, you're not thinking of anything else except for what's that bird doing and can I identify it and what, what are some, what, what's, what's its behavior, what habitats it in, um, you know, are there other birds around, um, those kind of things. So, yeah, I really find that that's, it's kind of like um, – you know, a, a meditative aspect to it where you're removing all other, and I find meditation hard because I've got a pretty busy brain most of the time. Uh, but birding, I find easy. I don't think of, I don't think of anything when I'm out birding, like, and it's just me, I'm just like dialed in. So, and, and that just gives a calm, relaxing kind of uh, feel too. So yeah, I think passing that on to students is, is, is pretty key. Totally. Yeah. And I, I love how you tapped into, you know, the aspect of, you know, losing track of time, you know, like the ebb flow state, you know, and, and kind of also hitting that level of, I call kind of like stillness, right, where nothing else matters and that active meditation space, you know, so I love that you're able to get that as well as you've noticed too, that all the students that you have in your course, that they also feel it too. And even if it's not right away, throughout the 15 weeks of the course that you see those those changes or those experiences or even if it's not you know every day when they come at some point you know they kind of experience it and it may, it may be in 10 years time as well that they'll they'll actually it'll the hooks will get them uh and and then you know you're planting seeds for for the future there and i find you could get it through you know so many things in nature too right like i find 
when I got a passion or an itch, I guess, for, you know, trail running, you know, I started to see, you know, and appreciate it and look at it different, you know, even though maybe let's say 10 years earlier, you know, I wasn't really into that. Right. So even if it's not now, they might catch it later for sure. Andy, something that I find crazy, you know, you've seen over a thousand species throughout the world. So are there any memorable bird watching stories that you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah. Well, first, firstly, I'll say I'm a lightweight over a thousand if, if there's any like hardcore birders listening, they're going to be like, nah, I've got him covered. But um, yeah, get, getting to a thousand was pretty cool. Um, it was a, a smooth build Annie, uh, which is a type of cuckoo uh, in Cuba. So uh, I was there with the family and I was out birding by myself and uh, we were there for Christmas, New Year. And um, yeah, I, I knew I was going to get my thousands uh, species that, that trip. And I, I had my list and I was counting it down and, you know, I was making a few predictions what I, what, what I would be. Uh, but then, yeah, I was, I was walking down this kind of dirt path near a, near a sewerage farm, actually, which is another great spot to, to go birding. Um, and, yeah, two of them jumped up onto the tree and got a few photos of it. And, um, yeah, that night, the first thing I did when I got back to the resort was buy a gigantic cigar and, uh, and smoke it um, in celebration of the thousand species. So, so that one was a good one. Um, there's also the ones you don't get, right? It's called dipping uh, in birding talk. So um, I remember one trip when I was back in Australia, uh, I was living in Adelaide and uh, an Antarctic tern had been spotted on the, uh, on the western tip of Kangaroo Island which is about a four hour drive plus a ferry uh, to get to. And basically there wouldn't be a lot of Antarctic turn sightings in on mainland Australia. Um, your best chance to get them is Patagonia kind of be- between kind of Patagonia and Antarctica is, is probably where you're going to see them most. So I was like, I'm going for this. So I jumped in the car. Um, this is, you know, I was, I was a single guy. Um, so I had the time to do it. Drove for four hours plus a ferry. Uh, staked out the the bluff that it was a bit, that had been seen on. Stayed there for like four hours, I reckon, to watch it. Slept, uh, camped that night. Woke up super early. Watched for another four hours. Didn't get the bird. Hopped back in the car and drove home. Um, so you know, it's just uh, that's that's part of it too. Is that you can you you can you can miss out, but you still have a, a great time doing it. Um, then there was. Um, you know, there was one uh, not, not so long ago, actually, there was a, a bird called a Bullock's Oriole, um, just seen Western Ottawa. Uh, it's, a, it's a Western species, so it's, you know, kind of um, California down in Mexico. Um, and, you know, sometimes during migrations, birds go go left when they should go straight um, and end up here. And um, I, I got the email about it. I was at work and I had um, my last two periods off. And I got the email and I did a bit of, you know, Google, Google mapping and I realized I can, I can drive there in two hours, drive back in two hours in time to pick my kids up from daycare, but it only gives me 30 minutes at the spot to, to get this bird. So I, I just did it and went after it and got there and I was, I, was, I was frantically searching for this bird and there was another couple of birders there too and they hadn't seen it. And then uh, with about five minutes to go on the clock, uh, I got the bird popped up. Uh, I was pretty pumped. It was the, uh, a, a pretty, pretty, uh, relaxed, excited, uh, drive home after that one. So, so that was great. And then it's just, you know, when you go, when you go overseas, when you go, when you go to tropical countries, like, uh, uh Costa Rica was a perfect example. Uh, we stayed, um, my wife and I stayed there one night at a place called Rancho Naturalista. It's in a, you know, cloud forest central, uh, a bit North of, uh, San Jose and, um, you know, before going there, I had a good idea on what, what birds were, were going to be around. And, you know, I spent, spent like eight hours with a guide that day and we got over a hundred species, uh, which is, it's a good day when you get over a hundred. Um, and yeah, just a couple of banger birds, like, a, a two hummingbirds in particular, a snowcap, which is, uh, I think the second or third smallest bird in the world. And then another one called a black crested coquette, which is like a the, the punk rock uh, mohawk style uh, of the hummingbird family. So, yeah, there's a there's a bunch there and I could go on forever. But, yeah, there's a few few main ones. I'm sure all my listeners were enjoying, you know, hearing some of those stories. 
I think it's really cool too. You're so connected, I find, with a lot of these stories, as well as you're kind of hungry for more, right? To see more species. And I, I know you're, you've recently set a goal, right? To see 2,500 species. We had said in the intro, you know, that's one fourth of the world's species. What is like the bird right now that you want to see most, you know, with your eyes next? Um, well, locally, locally, I'm probably, uh, uh, I, I've always been into birds of prey. Like that was like the peregrine falcon was the first one that got me. And then, you know, we've got in Australia, we have the wedge-tailed eagle, which is a massive bird and close relative to the golden eagle here in North America. Um, so I've always, I've always loved birds of prey. Um, yeah, that's, we call it a spark bird in birding, that first bird that you went, oh, wow, I need to know everything about that thing. So that was the peregrine for me. Um, I, you see them relatively regularly. Um, but yeah, the one, one that I haven't seen, uh, is a gear falcon. Uh, some people call it gear. Some people call it gear. Uh, I don't know. I call it gear. Um, anyhow, it's the, um, it's the largest falcon. Uh, it's, uh, comes in a couple of different color morphs and they have a white morph one, which is just, it's a bright white, uh, falcon. Um, they're, they're Arctic breeders. So they, they breed up in the, in the, in our summer, they'll be breeding on, on cliffs in the Arctic. Uh, and then in winter months, uh, they will push down South a bit. Um, and they will, they, their territories are massive. Uh, so they're really hard to kind of nail down. Uh, they don't really, they move around a lot. So it's not like, oh, you, you're getting one that's roosting at a spot regularly. Um, and I think they're the second fastest falcon outside the peregrine falcon which is the fastest living thing um yeah so the gear falcon's one that I, locally i really want um to, there was one last winter that i got close to but uh, i was i missed it by a day um so i'll keep keep chipping away at that one uh and then um i suppose the other one is uh in costa rica the resplendent quetzal i birded in costa rica uh it was like 2008 um i actually did a me and uh three mates did a uh, two mates did a backpack trip through Central America surfing uh, and we went from Costa Rica all the way up to Mexico. So went through some amazing bird territory, but I didn't have binoculars and I wasn't obsessed with birding at that time. And it's haunted me ever since. <laughs> so, um, and this bird, this bird's amazing. It's, it's part of the Trogan family. Uh, it's a frugivore, um, emerald green iridescence with, with some red, massive long tails on, on the males when they're, when it's breeding season. And uh, they're, they're just loved throughout Central America. Guatemala's currency is a Quetzal. Um, and so that, that's, that's a bird that I really want. And, and partly too, because my brother-in-law, who is not a birder, just like walked down a trail in Monteverde and everyone was looking up at a bird and he, he saw a, a resplendent Quetzal. So I'll get a text once a month from him asking me if I've seen one yet. And uh, he knows the answer is no still. So, so it's part, partly to get that monkey off the back as well. And have you ever seen a gray jay? Because I think that's Ontario's common one. Yeah, they're, they're, you have to go a bit north. Um, they're they're in every province, um, and they're they're boreal forest specialists. Um, and I just it's just one of those birds on the list that I don't have. That's like, oh, I shouldn't really tell people that I don't have a gray jay uh, or Canada jay, depending on uh, what what you want to use. Um, but yeah, I do not, and uh, I want to. Of course. <laughs> That's also one that you're adding to your list. Oh, there you go. You've got one and I don't. Oh, we're doing this now, are we? <laughs> cool. I like it. I like it. My next question, because I'm curious, right? You you were talking a little bit about, you know, some places where you've been, whether it was before you were into birding or now, you know, when you've been into birding. If you had to go anywhere on the earth right now to bird, where would you go and why? Because if I think about if I were to go somewhere, you know, I just researched like this topic, right? Madagascar species, right? They have so many birds out there, right? And, and ones that you can't find anywhere else in the world. Now, I don't want to trap you here, you know, in terms of your answer, but that's at least where I would want to go. So what about you? Uh, Madagascar would be cool. Um, but there, I don't even know if Madagascar has over a thousand species but what they do what you're talking about is endemics and yeah the endemics are the ones that you, you like australia is a perfect example of I've, I've got i think i've seen over 400 species in australia and, and at least pro, at least half of them are endemics maybe even more um i'd have to look into it a bit more but yeah so endemics are uh a big ones that you want for sure um for me though i, I kind of with my goal in mind of two and a half thousand 
uh, I want to go where the big numbers are. And the big numbers are the Neotropics uh, in Central South America. Um, and for me, it'd be Ecuador. Um, Colombia's number one. Colombia's got the most species, closely followed by Peru, uh, Brazil, and then Indonesia, I believe, is fourth. And then Ecuador is fifth, but not by much, by 100 or so species between each of those countries. Um, so Ecuador, I love the idea of Ecuador basically because, you know, it's pretty family friendly. Um, Colombia is getting safer now and, and a lot of bird tourism is going back there now. Uh, Peru is still a bit sketchy. Uh, Brazil can have its moments as well. Um, so I, I'd like to go somewhere that's that's family friendly, that's safe for the kids and, you know, the, my wife and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, so so Ecuador would be one. Um, I'd love to go back to Guatemala. I, I did Guatemala as a surfer, not as a birder. Uh, and that would be an amazing one. And just, yeah, I think I think those tropics, uh, they, they fascinate me. I recently bought a, a book uh, called The New Neotropical Companion by a guy named John Critchner, Critcher. Um, and it's it's my bedside reading right now, and it's basically uh, a handbook on on how the neotropics work, from vegetation to mammals to birds to reptiles to to amphibians. Uh, and it's a reference book; you wouldn't take it out in the field. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's incredible. It's an amazing amazing book. It's his second edition of it, and um, yeah, I, I love that part of the world. That's awesome. Well, something that I also want to talk about mushroom hunting you know is becoming super popular i know you also geek out on this subject and it's also part of you know your course so can you tell us a little bit about you know mushroom hunting and how it is i guess similar and different than bird watching yeah i um well i suppose firstly i kind of one of the courses i teach is uh orienteering um so at the beginning of each semester i have to set up um three different orienteering courses uh at the morgan arboretum and I'll, I'll walk that and I'll, I'll set up the controls, but I'll be birding at the same time. Uh, and what it should take me an hour and a half, but it takes me about four hours because I'm just birding and, and, you know, taking my time, going slow with it, not, not um, you know, no time crunch. And like, like you said before, losing complete track of time. Um, and yeah, so I obviously, you know, I'm noticing birds, but then I started in this one area, um, a, lot of, a lot of American beach. Uh, and it was a mix of American beech, sugar maple, uh, kind of kind of forest, some striped maple as well. Um, I was noticing, like, just in this area, there was, the mushroom diversity was crazy. So I'd, I'd take photos on my phone. I'd try to ID them when I got home. Then I realized that, you know, I, I'm way out of my depth here. I, I need to, you know, take samples and do spore prints and all those kind of things. And then I stumbled across an app called Picture Mushroom. Uh, so I started using that, and that's, that's a great app. Um, any... Any kind of old school mushroom foragers would probably poo-poo using an app, but I, I find using apps super accessible uh, for people who are coming in new, especially young people. Um, so I, I, I use that app with my students. Uh, I use uh, Merlin, which is a bird ID map by Cornell University again. So I'm, I'm pretty pretty keen on that. There's also a um, Merlin has a sound ID uh, component too. So as you're birding, you can just run the sound and it'll it's not accurate. You're like, you should never just based on what Merlin tells you that that bird is there, but it can give, it can confirm a suspicion, um, as well. So any outside story. So I started, I started using that app and then I stumbled across, um, a website called learn your land. Uh, it's a guy called Adam, Adam Harriton. Uh, he's, he lives in the Northeast of the U S and firstly, I just love that, that title for a website, learn your land. Cause that's basically what I want to do. I want to, I want to walk into an area and just like, feel that I know almost everything that's going on and and you know I hear something and I know it's that species or I see something and I can accurately say it's definitely that species um and just yeah feeling connected and kind of kind of knowing the secrets that's that's going on um I, I really enjoy that and so mushrooms was just one of those areas where I was just like you know what I know nothing about this um, so I, you know, the more I looked into learn your land, I then found he, he does an online course, uh, a mushroom foraging on, online course. So I reached out to the professional development uh, crew at, uh, John Abbott and applied for some funding and, and got the funding. And so I, I'm, you know, kind of halfway through his online learning course and it's, it's amazing. And it just added this awesome element to my course as well as to my own kind of, um, knowledge 
uh, in that, you know, sometimes birding can be fickle uh, if it's too windy or it's heavy rain and you've got a field trip, you, you've still got to, you've still got to go. Um, so, you know, the last field trip I had was a perfect example. Bird activity was super low. I think we got 12 species in, a, in five hours, which is crazy for, for fall migration. But what I was able to do then was go, okay, we're going to switch the focus today and we're going to, let's go mushroom foraging. And, you know, when we did our reflective kind of active learning uh, comments afterwards, the, the feedback was super positive. So I knew I was onto something there. And um, so, yeah, it's added that extra element. Um, you talk about, you know, I think 2,500 is a, a bold goal for bird species. Um, you know, mushrooms are in the fungi family. There's estimated to be over 5 million species. Um, most haven't been identified by science. About 100,000 uh, mushrooms have been identified by science. So you, it's ridiculous the, the level of diversity uh, that you have in mushrooms alone, not, not just fungi in general, but just mushrooms alone. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, a bottomless pit essentially, but yeah, it's so much joy and so much value and yeah. And probably the last thing, um, that, that I'll say about it is that, yeah, I actually foraged my first mushroom and ate it, um, about, uh, five weeks ago. And I, I, I was like, yeah, it was just like, man, I like, this is cool that I can, I can positively identify this. I went safe. I went, uh, it's a, it's a species called bear's head tooth. And it's part of uh, the genus Heresium. Uh, and basically any any species in the genus Heresium is edible. They basically look like a frozen waterfall uh, is the best way to describe this mushroom. It doesn't look like your typical cap mushroom. Um, and, yeah, so I, I knew it was bear's head tooth. I was 100% identified it. Never, never eat a mushroom you can't 100% identify. And, yeah, so I cooked it up, cleaned it up, showed the kids what I was doing. Um I was the only one who ate it. Everyone was a little bit gun shy, but I think I'll, I'll get them. I'll, I'll get them next next fall. I'll 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 go out foraging and we'll we'll make some. Um, it's got a kind of lobstery feel to it, so you can make um, crab cakes out of uh, bear's head tooth mushroom. So that's next year. That's awesome, and yeah, no, I I think you had a good point there too on you know being careful and and knowing what you're putting in, you know, um, especially with mushrooms knowing your knowing your skills as well like i'm not skilled in this area so so to to pretend i was it could be a uh, a very unenjoyable and potentially fatal um bit of arrogance if you if you let that get in there oh absolutely totally i have a good friend who knows quite a bit about mushrooms and uh an incredible cook as well right so when you go over to his place quite the cook you know and um and he had lobster mushrooms. I don't know if you've ever had those, but they are, they literally taste like a lobster, you know, like it was like in this pasta and it, oh, it was so, so good. So, so, so good. Have you ever found them? No, no. But my guess is it's part of this genus, this Heresium genus that I was talking about, because they all have that kind of lobster, kind of scallop, kind of uh, taste and aroma. Mm. Oh, so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll have to you'll have to keep an eye out because like they're really, really orangey red and they're big. Okay. Oh well, it's not in this one then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Homework. Yeah. Awesome. So, Andy, I do want to stay on the topic here of bird watching. You know, because it has so many positive effects. You know, on both physical health as well as our mental well being. And you know, there's so much studies that support. You know, that bird watching has reduced you know stress and anxiety. So, what are some other mental health benefits that we haven't talked about today? Yeah, well, I, I'd say they're two pretty big ones right there. Um, depression as well. Like uh, I'm someone who from a young age uh, had the anxiety, um, you know, probably from, you know, mid-teens onwards. And it was only probably until my 30s, my early 30s, that I really understood what was going on and ways to prevent it and ways to kind of buffer myself a, against it. Uh, and definitely things like exercise, uh, things like connecting with people and, you know, things like connecting with nature, uh, was, was so important for, for me. So I actually know, like, I'll, I'll say to my wife, I've got to go birding. Like it'll, I'll, there'll be like, I mightn't have gone birding for whatever reason for three weeks or something like that, but there will just be this, this urge that, okay, I need to, I need to go birding. I need to get out and I need to just like disconnect and kind of reboot the hard drive kind of thing 
Um, so yeah, for me, it's been super beneficial. And I, I talk about that a lot with the students because, you know, we, we've seen it, you know, during and post pandemic, the, the amount of anxiety that, that kids are experiencing, um, you know, that maybe, and I, I think maybe too Western kids as well, where it's like, well, it's been pretty good. Um, you know, it's a general statement, but they're, they've, you know, they haven't had a lot of adversity, had to face a lot of adversity. So they the levels of resilience maybe have to be built. Um, and this is one, this is one method that I really like passing on to them. And I, I like being really honest about it. I don't think it's something you shouldn't talk about and that, you know, this is one of the massive benefits that you, you, you get from it. And, you know, for me, there's no bad day in birding. Like I might go out and I might get 10 species or I might get a hundred like in Costa Rica. And it's like, obviously my levels of elation, depending on, we call them lifers. Uh, if you see a bird that you haven't seen before, it's a lifer. Uh, so if you get a lifer uh, locally, oh, that's massive. Uh, if you get a local a lifer when you're you're traveling, you're, you're expecting to get that those. But depending on what species it was, if it was a target bird, you get that you know nice endorphin rush. But either way, you still get it whether you get the lifer or not. You're you're, you're out. You're physical. You're active. You you're not sitting down. Uh, you're not in front of a screen. Um, you're, you're connecting, you're, you're alone with your thoughts. And, and sometimes those thoughts, you know, they disappear because you, if you, if you genuinely invested in the process, you, you, you're actually, you're switching those thoughts off. So yeah, no, I couldn't speak more highly about it. And, you know, if, if people, if that's their, their bent is they, they like, they like nature and they like any outdoors, any, anything like, you know, any kind of identification, whether it be mushrooms, trees, birds, um, you know, it's, it's, it's super valuable. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you there. I think, uh, you know, just, there's just so many benefits, right. Of, of being in nature and, and how humans are just so connected to it, you know, like in terms of the ecosystems and yeah, it's, it's, it's so important, you know, and, uh, especially all those benefits that you just spoke about. Something that I want to move to here, Andy, is we both teach college physical education. We inspire hundreds of students, you know, to live a healthy and active lifestyle. How have you inspired your students, you know, to foster a healthy relationship with physical activity through bird watching? Yeah, so I, I suppose it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I I like to push the narrative that there's no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, it's like it you you're coming in at different entry points, like. I'll have people who are, you know, I had one kid in my course this year. He's, he's right into snakes, and he's so he's he's dialed in. He's ready to go. And then there's other kids, uh, you know, maybe half the class have never actually used binoculars before, which which is pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, so I I just encourage an environment where it's, you know, it's it's okay. Like you, you, I'm going to make mistakes. Like I, I, <laughs> this is a good one. Actually last, last, uh, winter semester, um, we had a field trip, uh, to a place called techno park Montreal and it backs onto, uh, the, the airport in Montreal here and, uh, airports are good places for snowy owls and often you'll get snowy owls there. And I, I had one in my scope. I showed every kid in the class and then the bus driver came in and he said, Oh, can I have a look? He looked, and he goes, Oh, it looks like a pile of snow. And I went, no, no, it's a snowy owl. And then I looked at it and it was a pile of snow. And I had to go into the bus and explain to everyone that it wasn't a snowy owl. It was actually a pile of snow that I was looking at. So it's like, you know, you've got to be fallible and you've got to show them that you're, you know, you're not perfect and it's okay to make mistakes because then they're, they're going to be more encouraged to, to ask questions and, you know, switch, in, switch on and kind of try to solve problems themselves. Um, so, yeah, I'm big on that and I'm big on just like, being you know what wherever you take this um it's up to you like look some of them I, I warn them some of you will get addicted to this you'll 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 love this and you'll want more and and that's great but just realize there's you know you you have to put it in perspective and then there's others who will drop it at the end of the course and never return to it but there might be some that they'll return to it in 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 years to come so yeah, there's no real expectations there in that. It's pretty low the expectations on you know how 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 heavy they go into it. Um, but yeah, and then the other thing is like I suppose I, with the eBird app, you know, it also tracks your kilometers. So after a class, I can show them look, hey, or a field trip, I can show them a field trip will do ten kilometers. 
and you know they're they're pretty gassed at the end of it and even a class we're doing you know three kilometers if we're if we're if i'm pushing them um and it's only i've only got an hour and a bit with them uh once we do bus travel um so yeah just showing them that you know yeah it's low level cardio you're not you're not going to become a an olympic 400 meter runner by doing birding but but there are benefits of just the movement aspect to it um and just elevating that heart rate a little bit it's not the only thing you need to add to it that's why it's a nature identification and fitness course uh but it can be part of the puzzle absolutely yeah no i i totally agree with you so andy as you know the purpose of this podcast is to inspire millions of people to achieve greatness and enhance their overall personal well-being so what is your definition of greatness like for me, I kind of I when I when I started the podcast, the the Rugby Coaches Corner podcast, I, I started. I was listening to a podcast called uh, the Iron Chalk Talk, uh, Iron Chalk Talk, and it's basically a strength and conditioning uh, podcast. A guy named Ron McKeefrey. Um he was one of the first kind of S and C podcast guys, and uh, I I was teaching in the weight room a lot in my previous school, and so I was I was upskilling myself with his pod, and he used to always say, um, "Make it the big time where you're at." And I, I really like that. I think often, especially with my coaching and sometimes with living in Canada as well in the early years that I lived here, I was also always thinking too far ahead. Like, okay, I'm coaching here, but I actually really want to coach here and then I want to coach here. So I'm not actually making it the big time where I'm at with the team I've got. And I was the same. Oh, that's my bird clock uh, chiming in the background if there's any background noises. Um yeah, and I was also doing that, you know, living here. I was always like, oh, we, we'll live here for four years and then we'll move back to Australia. And and I just think that's a really good philosophy is just make it the big time where you're at. Um, be great where you are right now. So be a great dad, be a great husband, um, you know, be a great teacher. And you you know, you know, when you're, when you're doing something half-assed and you've got to be honest with yourself and you've got to turn the mirror inwards and, and critique yourself and, and, and look to get better and, and, and review and reflect. And so I, I, that would be greatness for me. I, I don't think I'd have a big kind of uh, big statement on it or any kind of overall philosophy, but I think if you can be great in your, in your little ecosystem, I think that's pretty awesome. I like that. Um, what I got from it is, you know, being your best version of your authentic self and kind of doing that like moment to moment. So moment to moment greatness um, and not over kind of, you know, thinking it, but but being, you know, true to yourself. Andy, who is a future guest that you'd like to see on the show? Ooh, um, I think uh, we'll stay with the birding theme. Uh, I think someone like uh, a guy named Ken Kaufman. Uh, he's, uh, he's a birder in the U.S., um, and he'd probably be in his 60s yeah probably in his 60s um he's uh he's a legend in the uh the u.s birding uh community um he wrote a book called kingbird highway and he was one of the first birders to do what's called a big year um and there's the movie there's the movie the big year which is i'd say 90 percent accurate it's a it's a good movie i really enjoyed it um but basically a big year is that you start on january 1st and you go the entire year and you try and see as many species as you can in that one year and he was he was focused on north america so so he did u.s canada and out to alaska and uh the aleutian kind of island chain there uh is all part of the u.s so he and he did it hitchhiking uh he did it in the 70s hitchhiking and um his book's amazing. You read that book and you're just like, I've got to travel right now. I, I need to leave and go birding. Um, and just, he, yeah, he's a really good storyteller, uh, really eloquent and, um, you know, uh, has been a, a great advocate for, you know, certain certain areas for conservation. Um, I think McGee Marsh uh, in Ohio, which is a major stop off for, for warbler migration in fall and spring. I think he was uh, heavily involved in that. And, uh, yeah, just a just a great advocate for birding in general. That's awesome, Andy. Well, I appreciate that name, and I'll definitely do uh, you know some search on that and and kind of see what he's about. And Andy, where is the best place for my listeners to go to connect with you online? Um, I'd probably Twitter at uh, Andy Plymer, and uh, and then even uh, if you're interested in uh, 
boosting uh, the uh, Instagram follows for my uh, Nature ID course. I've got a, I've got an Instagram page where I just put photos up of of things we see on field trips and class trips. So it's uh, it's J A C underscore Nature underscore ID. Um, so I think we're at sixty followers. So it'd be great to get to sixty one, seventy. You know. That's awesome, Andy. Yeah. And uh, I've seen a couple of the photos and he has it, you know, at the college, you know, by his desk. I've seen some birds. They are marvelous. So it is worth your time to check it out. And Andy, I just want to, you know, end off, you know, today's episode, you know, for thanking you for being here. I know uh, you're a father. You're also, you know, full-time teacher, podcaster. So I, I really appreciate you for being here today and sharing your passion on birding. All right. Thanks for having me. I um. Stoked to talk about birds. Um, it's yeah, obviously I'm right into it, but it's great, great to have an outlet to do it. And what you're doing is awesome too with the pod. And um, you know, the the more content out there that people can use for for self help, the better. So great job. Thank you for listening to the Living Your Greatness podcast. If this show has added value, please subscribe, leave a rating, and make a review.